Well, I'm so glad to be here this morning, and we've uh, been blessed this week beyond measure. Uh, this past Sunday, the doors opened. We were able to get back into church, uh, practicing social distancing, wearing the mask, and all of that, uh, which was great. It was awesome. We have a tent up outside. We want to welcome everybody to, to come back to church now. We want to ask you to come back with uh, uh, an open heart and, and, and an open uh, uh, mind because some of the things that you're going to experience when you get back to church are a little different than when you left. But all in all, we're making progress. And I think this coming Sunday, we're going to see even more people coming, uh, enjoying a service here inside the sanctuary. And uh, uh, this coming sur Sunday, I believe the uh, mass will be optional. So uh, those of you who couldn't breathe last week and uh, not comfortable with the mass, we just ask that you do practice the social distancing. And it, listen, if you are a little more cautious and you have a right to be, especially if you have pre-existing conditions or you don't feel it's safe for whatever reason, our sanctuary is huge. So you can spread out even further, keep the mask on, and do whatever uh, you feel is necessary to keep you safe. We're going to do our part, We're sanitizing the, the sanctuary after each service, uh, taking care of the bathrooms on a continual basis. So we're making every effort to keep us um, as free from that virus as we possibly can. Uh, this, uh, this coming uh, week, we also have an added blessing. This is what I was so excited about. Many of you have been joining us here on Thursday uh, uh, morning, and I'm so blessed to have you. Some of you are uh, new to the ministry here at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. I do want to thank you for tuning in. But, but some of you are just waiting anxiously to get back to our Bible study that we've been doing for so many years. And, and it's, I, it's part of my life to see this room uh, filled with people that want to hear God's word. And we've been doing it here at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs for a long, long time. Well, it's going to start up again next Thursday. So next Thursday, I want to welcome you all back into uh, the church for Thursday morning Bible study uh, at 10 a.m. So like, we'll still be on the Internet, though, for a while. As long as there are people listening, we'll be on the Internet and those of you who can't come or maybe don't feel quite safe yet, hey, tune in and uh, listen to us on the Internet. It'll be live then, by the way, so you'll get kind of a feel for what we do here on a normal basis. So with all that being said, we've got a lot to be thankful for. I do want to ask you, if you are in need of prayer right now, if you have anything going on in your life, that you're struggling over. This is a difficult time in the world. We need to pray for our government, government, uh, for our, our nation, for our cities, our states, uh, the election that's coming up, everything in prayer uh, we lay before the Lord. And all good things are birthed in prayer, so I want to encourage you at home, keep things in prayer. You know, um, demonstrations and things like that, I'm glad we live in a free country, but those aren't the answer. Those aren't the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. Just think if everybody, everybody followed the word of God, everybody knew what God's intentions are for us and for what he has to offer us uh, in, in the freedom that he gives to us, having been forgiven of our sin. And it changes. The Bible says we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And uh, to live in Christ, there's nothing like it. And it does solve a lot of the social issues that are in the world today. Um, people that are in Christ know that, you, you know what, we're all born. We're all born of, of, in Christ. And, and we all have the same heritage in Christ. There, there's not one of us that is any better than anyone else. And uh, God created us equal in every way. And we all love the Lord. And if we can just focus on him right now, I want to ask you to pray with me. Father God, I, I pray this morning, Lord, as we begin your word, that our hearts be upon you, Father. And if there be any listening this morning, Lord, who have fallen away, slipped away, Lord, drifted away, and, but they're back, Lord, and they're seeking you. May you bless them, Lord, with knowledge and wisdom through your word. And Lord, may your Holy Spirit, Lord, build them up and strengthen them and encourage them each and every day. And for those who are sick, Father, may you heal them. And may you bless them this morning, giving them confidence in Christ. 
that you are the author and finisher of our great faith and you are in control of all things. And Lord, I pray that you would bless Rawl and bless Sharon and Kathy and so many others that are really ill right now for Dr. Jim. Lord, I pray you heal them of their cancer. And Lord God, I ask now, Father, that nothing be between anyone listening and me but your Holy Spirit, that we lean upon you, we rest in you, Father, and we look forward through the eyes of Christ to what you will have in store for us. I love you, Father. I praise you. I thank you for this morning, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. And together we said, Amen. is 
is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names. You're the name above all names. Worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great. I love starting the Bible study with that song uh, because it does ask a question. It asks a question of us all. How great is your God? Well, I tell you what, my God not only is awesome and he is wonderful in every way, but the fact that he is great, he is huge, he is immense, he is able to do all things exceedingly and wonderfully above all others, I look to God as my life. I look to him as my breath. I look to him as my future. And I'm so glad I can look to him as my future because of the day we live in today. Many of you know who are listening right now. We're up against some tremendous odds. The world seems to be going in so many different directions right now. In many states, in many cities, there's chaos, there's struggle, there's people arguing against one another, and some who are saying, you know, what are we going to be looking at in the next years to come? Well, I don't really know the future. I don't know the future, but I know who holds the future. And I'll tell you what, because I know who holds the future, everything else kind of makes sense to me. And it, and, it, and it gives me a great confidence because man can't solve the problems that are before us. I guarantee you, there's always going to be racism. There's always going to be injustice. There's always going to be bad people in this world. And those things that I mentioned are a result of bad people, not good people. They're bad people. Well, the Bible is my confidence. What will take place in the future has been written in God's word. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, I know every detail and everything exactly the way it's going to take place. But if you listen to your Bible and you listen to God's word, then you're going to be ready for what is going to take place. Now, in, we are currently in the book of 1 Thessalonians. If you would turn to chapter 5, because in the 4th chapter and in the 5th chapter, Paul is taking the, the, the Thessalonican church and pointing them to the future in regards to what things are going to take place in this world. And he wants them to be smart. He doesn't... He said last week, I don't want you to be ignorant about um, the coming or, or about the, the end days. I don't want you to be ignorant about what is going to take place and uh, ab about those who have fallen asleep and those who have died, that you would mourn as those who have no hope. And otherwise, listen, if you don't know what's going to take place, your eyes are going to be on the world. 
And, and if your eyes are on the world, I guarantee you, you're going to be depressed. You're going to be, you're going to feel oppressed. You're, 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 you know, uh, you're going to be like so many. I don't even want to turn on the TV because I'm afraid the news might come on. I don't want to listen to the radio because I'm afraid that there may be uh, a break in and uh, or a, um, an alert on the radio of bad things happening. Well, uh, those things are going to happen, by the way, but we can be prepared. This was Paul's intention for the church in Thessalonica. Hey, not that you be ignorant. No, no, no. I've given you the word of God. It, it's up to you to listen. It's up to you to, to pay attention. It's up to you to take it seriously. And I just want to begin what I'm about to say, uh, going back to the fourth chapter, to remind you of what he said in the fourth chapter in regards to the things that are going to take place. Now, if you've been a part of Calvary Chapel or part of a Bible teaching church, you've inevitably gone through the book of Revelation at some point in time. Or you've been taught about the rapture of the church. And the church itself, where we are today, and it's not just Calvary Chapel, but the entire body of Christ, the church is waiting for this next great event in the history of the Word of God, and that is the rapture of the church. Well, what is the rapture of the church? Paul described it to them once again in the 13th verse of the fourth chapter. I'm just going to end because that's the end of the fourth chapter. It leads us into the fifth. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Because he, you see, the church in Thessalonica were afraid that those who had fallen asleep aren't going to get, to get to experience this great and awesome moment where God takes us up to be with him. Well, uh, he wanted them to know that God didn't forget them and God didn't. Listen, God isn't limited by their death because he said when you die, don't you know you don't die? He said that to Martha and Mary at the grave of Lazarus, didn't he? Don't you? If you believe in me, you shall never die. Well, this is the message he's trying to get to them, uh, which would obviously make them not sorrow as others who have no hope. Because if you don't have the Lord, I guarantee you, you have no hope of eternal life. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until when? The coming of the Lord. And we'll call this the, rap the beginning of the rapture of the church. Now, now, the coming of the Lord takes place over a period of time. But it begins with the rapture of the church. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The Lord is returning, but he's not returning to stay. Seven years have to pass. Something else has to take place. But what is he doing? He's coming to receive his church. In the New Testament, we saw that. In the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And you read this over and over again when you go to funerals in most cases. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the verse. And that verse right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and another one in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 teach us this doctrine of the rapture of the church. Christ coming, not to stay, but to take his church out of this earth. When you get to the book of Revelation, and you can, from the 6th chapter to the 18th chapter, you see this period of time that takes place after the tribulation. Now, back to the 5th chapter, 
of Thessalonians. Just wanted to remind you that the rapture of the church that we're waiting for now has not yet taken place, but believe me, before the day of the Lord, there will be the rapture of the church. <coughs> Verse five, or chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, underline that, the day of the Lord, because we're going to talk about it, so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Ah, a warning, a reminder, the day of the Lord is coming. You know, the... The funny thing is that God gives us these signs. He gives us these words. He tells us what is going to take place before the day of the Lord. And people ignore it. They turn away from it. I tell you, and, and it reminded me of Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 3. I'm not going to read it all, but there Jesus uh, criticized the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Why did he do that? Because they weren't willing to discern the signs of the times. Listen, we need to study the scriptures. And then, listen, when you study the scriptures, look around to the world. Look to the world. And I'll tell you, people want to just uh, sit back, and wait for somebody to tell them something. And if you open your, uh, your, your computer or if you go to the Internet and I'll tell you what, and you look up um, the rapture of the church or you look up the tribulation or the, the great tribulation, uh, you look up uh, the Armageddon, you, you look up all the things that haven't happened yet, but you know are going to happen in the Bible. And listen, if, if, you, don't, if you don't study God's word, you're going to be as confused as all get out. Because everybody, how everybody has something to say about it. I recommend you, listen, you study God's word and then do this. And then let the word prove what's going on around us to be true. And to tell us, to discern to us what the time is. To discern to us what the time is. I got to know what the Bible says that I'm to look to. You know, uh, Paul writes here. Be, listen, concerning the times and seasons. He's pointing us to what? He's pointing us to the clock and to what takes place during time. It reminded me of Ecclesiastes 3.1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. You know what that paints a picture to me of? That means God has a calendar in heaven. God has a preordained time for everything that his word said would happen to happen. How close, how close are we? There's a couple of things that uh, we don't know in the Bible. You know, when, when we saw the rapture of the church, we're, we see there that we're going to, at that point in time, receive our heavenly bodies. I don't know what the heavenly body is going to look like. I hope it's got a lot of hair. I hope I'm slimmed down a little bit. You know, I'm already good looking, so I, I don't know, you know, how much you know, more good looking I, I'm going to get. Um, but um, listen, it doesn't really matter. Does it really matter? It doesn't matter at all. All I know is I'm getting a brand new body and the old body is being left behind. Are you glad of that, Luann? That we get to leave the old body behind when we're raptured into heaven. We get a brand new body and it's going to be A1 because God doesn't make junk. I'm so looking forward to that. Here's another thing I don't know. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know. And listen, there's been a lot of clowns on TV that try and get you to watch them. And they want you to buy their book. And they've got this hidden message. 
Hey, stay away from that stuff. There's nothing. There's no new revelation. This, this stuff is nuts. God give, gave to us already everything we need in the Bible, and it's easy to understand. It's not. There are certain things, I guarantee you, that are hard to understand. But the Bible in itself, easy to understand, taken in its context, we can't go wrong. Most of the false teachers out there, most of the people that are trying to get you to believe something that isn't true, have taken the Bible out of context, or they've inserted things into the Bible rather than taken things out of the Bible to meet their own narrative. So we only want to use the Word of God. Well, what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Put that verse in your mind. I said to you, underline the day of the Lord. Well, Jesus is talking about this in Matthew 24. But of that day and that hour, listen, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. I haven't given this information to anybody, and I haven't given it to any modern-day pastor either or organization that tries to tell you they know the day and the hour. Who knows? My Father only knows. Verse 37, Matthew 24. But as, here's a sign. This is what I want you to pay attention to, people, this morning. If you're sitting there in your, in your uh, living rooms right now or wherever you're at, pay attention. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he describes the days of Noah. For as in the days before the flood, they were, listen, eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Well, hey, there was a lot going on. Marriage didn't mean anything. It was as though it was just a ritual. Well, marry, don't like who I'm married to, I'll marry somebody else. Marriage wasn't taken seriously at all. They were gluttonous. They were wasting food. They were using food that uh, they shouldn't be using. They were doing things they shouldn't be doing. Immorality was out the door. They had turned to the worship of idols. And, and, and listen, their life was about me, myself, and I. Well, sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? Immorality out the door today. Today, I think what we've seen is people are saying, what is right has been right for hundreds of years. Now is wrong. And what is wrong is right. If you're older, a little older, if you're as old as I am, you have seen some changes in the past 50 years that you never thought would take place. I'm not going to go over them one by one, but if you're sitting there and you're being honest with yourself, and please don't be misled by, by wanting to be like everybody else. Listen, Bible says that we are to be sanctified, and only God can sanctify us. And when, listen, when, when your conscience rears up its head against some of these things that are being shoved down our throat and told that they are right, don't let the world change your heart. Don't let the world change lead you away from the truth you might be like those who at the time of the flood were hammering on the door trying to get in they couldn't get in only eight were saved why because they waited too long they didn't listen and they weren't discerning the time i just want everybody out there to understand the time has come I believe the Lord's coming is very soon. I don't know when he's going to come, and no pastor that worth his weight will tell you that they know when he's coming. But I can tell you this. I can see what's happening in the world today, and don't you feel a little different right now? Don't you feel a little different? because Listen, because of one little virus, one little uh, uh, uh I mean, they're so small, they breathe them through the air. Landed on one person, and that one person began to uh, infect other people. And now the whole world is infected because of one little microbe, one little thing. And now, and now we're, we're not able, at one point, we weren't able to leave our house, stop the world, stop the economy. It created havoc. We're, we're still recovering. We're still lame. We're still not back to normal. I don't know if we'll ever get back to normal. Things have changed. 
I mean, the world feels different. I can see things coming to pass. Why? Because, hey, open the word of God. You open the word of God and you let God speak to you. You discern the time with the word of God. And then you look out into the world and you see what's happening. This in verse 40 of that particular verse in Matthew 24. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, verse 42, listen. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. Why? Because you are the master of your home. Ladies, if your husband doesn't want to do it, you do it. Children, if your parents don't want to do it, you do it. There's no excuse for us individually not to do what God's word tells us to do. And we are to be watchful for the day is coming. The man of the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And I tell you, he's coming the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will come after the rapture of the church. And the New Testament calls it a day of wrath a day of visitation, the great day of the Almighty. You can find it in Revelation chapter uh, 6 through 18. It refers to a future fulfillment of God's word when the promise of his wrath is going to be poured out upon this world and an unbelieving Israel. We're told about the day of the Lord in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Just briefly in Isaiah 22, verse 2. For it is a day of trouble and treading down and perplexity, Isaiah writes, by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. Listen, there's going to be some good that comes out of it, though. In Romans chapter eleven twenty six, it's a time of judgment, but it's also a time of salvation as God uses this time to deliver the remnant of Israel, fulfilling the promise that all of Israel will be saved. They reject Christ. They get left behind. But what happens? Romans 11, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this. Here, Paul loved to call people ignorant. And he didn't want to call them anything but ignorant because it was so important for them to know these things. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Oh, I need to know the word of God or otherwise it's going to be all about my opinion. And listen, my opinion doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't count at all. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Well, the, the day of the Lord is on its way. What? Let me give you one more thing. The day, let's look at it. I, I know this for a fact. The great tribulation is part of that day of the Lord. It's wrath. It's judgment. Do you know why we're going to see those seven years? We're not going to be here. We're going to find out in this chapter that we are not subject to the wrath of God. So I'm so thankful that I know I'm not going to be here. But what do the people who are going to be here have in store for them? And why is God so mean that he's going to just, just bring judgment upon this world? There's a purpose for the great tribulation. We find it in the... In, in the book of Daniel, in the ninth chapter, he gives us a great illustration of what it tells us all about it. If you've never studied prophecy and you don't know what to look forward to, let me just give you a hint. Here in the fifth chapter, he's just going to skim over it, but I'm going to give you a little more in depth. In ja Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined. Remember that. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city, Jerusalem. And here's why. Six, six reasons why the tribulation is taking place. To finish the, the transgression. It's going to be over. 
to make an end of sins, plural, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So the purpose of the great tribulation. This is really, this is something I just want to put into your heads for a moment, because there's some people I'm sure listening today, you've had a great injustice done to you. Maybe something happened to you that you, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? I think of it every time I hear of a, a baby killed. I think of it every time I, I hear of a, of a child who has been molested or even worse, molested and murdered. I think, Lord, how can you let that guy get away with it? You just want to go in there and take the law into your own hands. I know that feeling. There are things that have happened to entire nations that, Lord, why? I even heard people say, well, if God is so good, why did he allow that to happen? Looks like uh, you got it all wrong. The, the wicked do prosper. Well, maybe in your eyes, because you don't know the Lord, but I know the Lord and I know the day is coming. And listen, this is the day that's coming where all things that were done wrong will be made right. This is why, listen, you don't need to take the law into your own hands. You don't need to seek vengeance. Why the day is coming that everything, everything that was done wrong on this earth will be paid for. It brings an end to these things. I'm looking forward to it so very much. In verse 25 of Daniel chapter 9. Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command. Listen carefully to restore and build Jerusalem. This is the time of Nehemiah. You've got to read the book of Nehemiah. Until Messiah the Prince, when Christ, listen, entered gloriously on the week of the Passion into Jerusalem to do what? He, he is the Messiah. He is going to die on the cross for the remission of sin. He's going to pay the price for our sin. He is going to grace. This dispensation of grace begins. What a tremendous moment. What tremendous landmarks we have. Now, from the time Nehemiah went to begin to build that wall around Jerusalem, March 14th, 445 B.C., to the entry of Christ on a donkey into Jerusalem, April the 6th, 32 A.D., equals 483 years or 69 weeks. We need one more week. We need 490 years. So when does that happen? If you would, go down to the 27th verse of Daniel chapter 9. Then we shall confirm a covenant with many for, listen, one week or seven years. Now, in the middle of the week, three and a half years pass. After the rapture of the church, things seem to be kind of all right. We see changes taking place. But in the middle of the week, Listen, that covenant that was made was made between, we believe, a one world leader. We believe that there's going to be someone who is lifted up, who makes an agreement with, yeah, the Arab world to build a temple on the mount, that holy mount where you go to Israel today and you see that big golden mosque it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but it's that mount, that mount, that mount where we believe the third temple will be built because, listen, somebody convinced the Arab world that it's okay and we have peace in Israel. Doesn't sound real, but it's going to happen. There's even evidence of it happening right now. And upon the temple mount, we will see the third temple built. And that this agreement will be made that a Israel will be able to go back in there and begin their sacrifices. The Jews will be able to sacrifice in the temple. But right there in the middle of the, the seven years, after three and a half years, what does it say? But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of, listen, abominations desolation of abomination shall be one who makes desolate 
the Antichrist, will raise up. Three and a half weeks, enter into the temple. An image will be built. You must worship me. Wow. Now, the three and a half years that, that follow it, those three, the last three and a half years will be known as the Great Tribulation. And you can read about the destruction, the wrath of God that is about to hit the world. Go back to the fifth chapter of Thessalonians. Now that you know uh, the wrath of God is the day of the Lord and uh, what's going to take place in that day. Isaiah said in Isaiah 2.17, The loftiness of man will be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So the Lord comes. How does he come? Listen, I like this. He's coming suddenly like a thief in the night. Some say peace and safety, and it says in verse 3, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. That expression, labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Now, I don't know why women complain so much about having a baby. It doesn't seem that hard to me. Uh, you just lie there and the baby comes. Now, nah, I've been in uh, three times and then with eight grandkids. I'm always at the hospital and I, I kind of avoid that room because some of the sounds coming out of it. Oh, ladies, my hat's off to you. I, I had, a, I had a, a woman tell me one time when I was making light of having a baby, she says, do you know the pain of having a baby? I said, I've, none, I've, I've withstood a lot of pain. I'm a pretty tough guy. And she said, well, let me just explain it to you. Can you grab your bottom lip? And I said, sure. And she says, now pull it out. Pull it out as far as you can. Squeeze it as hard. I, that's hurting. That's hurting a lot. She said, well, just pull it out as far as you can. And I said, okay. And I got it out there. She said, now pull it over your head. <laughs> and I said, well, that's as far as I want to go. But she said, but now you're just beginning to understand how great that pain can be. I like what Trapp wrote on uh, this particular phrase, uh, labor pains, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Three things he says to think about, the certainty of what's taking place. That baby's coming, ain't nothing you can do to stop it. This is what, what, what Paul is meaning. He says, there isn't a thing you can do about it. You know it's coming. You feel it. And don't you feel it at home? Don't you see what's going on in society and in the world and with morality? Don't you see it? Doesn't it hurt you? Man, it hurts me. It hurts me when I see my children and my grandchildren. I'm old. And I know my, I can see a lot further behind me than I can before me. But I have, listen, I have a three-year-old grandson. And I have a lot of grandchildren in between. And I have, grand, and I have children. And they're going to have to be here probably when I'm long gone. And they're going to feel it. Listen, if the Lord tarries, they're going to feel it worse than I feel it now. And, and I can't hardly stand it right now because I, that's why it bothers me. So I get so angry when I hear even men from the church. I'm telling you, pastors, you're going to be held accountable for every word that comes out of your mouth where you compromise or whitewash God's word just to get more people to watch you. You're trying to make that pain feel better. I'm not going to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, feel the pain. Recognize the Lord is on his way. And we have a, this urgency in our heart to share God, to share the word of God, that the, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, would lead people to salvation, that they would not have to go through this. God is showing us. He's teaching us. We should feel uncomfortable in this, in this world that we live in right now because with certainty he's coming. And then Trapp said, suddenly... Suddenly, suddenly is the word. You know, when you're lying there in that bed, or and my wife's had three babies, and, and, and I think one of them took a long time to come, and one came really fast. But both times, when it was time to come out, it popped. It's sudden. And there's nothing that you can do to stop it except to know except to know that what is going to take place is going to take place like that. Maybe 
there's things we cannot do to change the future. But there are things we can do to see change. We can't change the world, but there are things we can do to see change. That's why I, listen, support every single pastor that gets up and with authority and boldness teaches the truth. Because that will change lives. That will change hearts. That will change attitudes. That will change behaviors. People, this is the answer. And we need the answer because the Lord is coming. Thirdly, Trapp said, he comes certain with, with certainty he's coming. He's coming suddenly. And lastly, he's coming irresistibly, inevitably irresistibly, inevitably. The Lord is on his way. Nothing will change that at the moment he wants. He could come before I finish this message. But here's the beauty in this passage. Look what it says. Go back to the word of God. Verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day, the day of the Lord should overtake you as a thief. You, all, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Paul said that to the Ephesians. Be children of light. You were once in darkness. I understood it. We once didn't know what was happening. We, hey, it was just the news. What are you so upset about? It's going to fade away. It's going to get better. Things aren't going to get better. Unless you're in darkness. When you're in the light, you see everything. And not, this is, has a twofold meaning. One, listen, for our own good, we are children of light. But we're also children of light for another purpose, to help others see. You know what? Don't feel badly when you walk into a room and people are, or, or, oh, no, there's, a, there, there's Donna, you know, holier than thou. There, you know, she's, uh, you know, hey, better watch your language. You better, you don't feel bad. You didn't, listen, you didn't do that because of who you are. You did that because of what you are. You're a child of God. You're a child of the light. You bear light. And that means you bear light to darkness. When, when you come in, darkness flees. Now people will be condemned. They, they are not condemned, but they will be uh, convicted. Their conscience will be bothered just by you being there. Listen, because darkness and light cannot abide together without some, something happening. And generally what happens is people want to look at you and sort you out and probably wish you weren't there. Why? Because you're a child of light. We are not of the night nor of darkness, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet of hope and salvation. This is not picking up the sword time. I'm not going to, listen, I don't need to defend myself. God is, God is my defense. But what do I do need to do? I need to protect, listen, I need to protect my faith, and I need to protect my hope, my mind, my helmet, the shield of faith, my salvation. They're up for grabs in this world. People want to destroy you. People want to wipe you out and, and to change your thoughts. That's why I think there's this huge, I think it is a, a huge effort by the world to quiet the church. It, wasn't it amazing the churches were the last ones to open? Can you imagine Home Depot never closed? And I've been to Home Depot three or four times during that quarantine or during that uh, stay home time. And every time I went, that line was a mile long, and nobody was practicing social distancing. Everybody was talking by lifting up their mask. I'm not putting it down so much. Uh, Costco was open. Sam's Club was open. But the church wasn't open. Amazing. 
I think there's an underlying message there that the world can't even explain. They want to they wanna look at us and say, oh, you're just presuming a lot. No, I'm not presuming anything. Why'd you shut down the church? If there's anything essential in the time of tragedy, it's the church. You shut, shut down the hospitals, hospitals will save you, listen, for a moment. The church will save you for all eternity. So why did you shut down the churches? Let us be sober. Let us know this. Verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I am not, listen, I am not subject to wrath. I am not subject to the wrath of God. You know why? He paid for my, my wrath on the cross. He took it. He took the wrath upon the cross for me. That this is what makes us all so humble in the Lord. Because, listen, anyone out there that's listening, I don't care what you've done. I don't care the magnitude of your sin, the extent of your sin. Christ dying on that cross has sent an invitation to every single person listening today, anybody who has ever heard the gospel, that he died once and he died for all. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever should believeth upon him should never perish, but have eternal life. What an offer. And what, listen, what, what grace the Lord has bestowed upon us. Immeasurable. Unmerited favor. We did not die on that cross. Christ did it for us. Therefore, verse 11, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. And I hope this is an edifying message to you this morning. Verse 12, and we are now he's going to get into some exhortations. There's actually 21 of them. Uh, 21 various exhortations. That listen, I like the way uh, J. Vernon McGee said this. These are commandments to the believer. This is a commandment. You can't just pick and choose what you want to do today. You can't just walk into church and say, I'll take some of that and some of that, and I'll leave that and I'll leave that. Now you become a half-hearted, half-powered, half-prepared Christian by doing that. You want to be fully filled. You want to be fully prepared. You want to walk with the Lord in perfected perfectedness not that you're perfect but he's perfect and the way you're doing it is perfect you're letting him lead you and guide you listen we were given 10 commandments we know we couldn't fulfill them but here in the new testament jesus said i've come to fulfill those 10 commandments now listen to me and on the sermon on the mount he told us how to live these are the laws we have these are the commandments words in red listen words in red are not listen are not uh options Words in red aren't suggestions. Words in red are commands of God. And so here uh, Paul gives to them and to us, because we're going to see this letter was given to the church. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. It's easy. Listen, it's easy to recognize those who labor among me. But hey, when I got saved, this guy got saved, and now he's been given authority over me. Anytime you've ever questioned the person who's in authority over you, stop it now. Stop it now. It's not about who's in authority over who. It's about servanthood. It's about humility. And it's about the willingness to accept who God uses God gives grace to whom God gives grace. God has given to each one a gift. That's what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians. Everybody has a gift. God blessed us all with the ability to be used by him. But yet, sometimes this whole thing about authority bugs us so much. But what does Paul say here to Thessalonians? He says, listen, recognize those who labor among you and those who are over you. In verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. They need us. Pray for your pastor. Pray for the leaders in the church. 
pray for them. Whether you like them or not, you pray for them and you esteem them and you love them and you love them in the Lord Jesus Christ because this is what we're supposed to do. Verse 14, now we exhort you, brethren, what are we to do next? Warn those who are unruly. What? I just want them to go to hell. No. Uh Uh-uh. Listen, everybody's deserving of a warning. Wasn't it Ezekiel and uh, Ezekiel uh, 3 and uh, 13? God said, you know, I need a man who will stand in the gap, protecting Ezekiel was that man. And listen, he knew about warning. He knew that the blood would be upon his hands, and blood is on our hands if we don't warn, even those who are unruly, the people that are most difficult to be with. You and, listen, in the spirit of the Lord, go. Warn those who are unruly. Listen, comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. Verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for, for yourselves and for all. This is, the, this is the diagram, the blueprint of a great and wonderful church. Verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What is the will of God in your life? I've had people banging their head on the wall. Oh, I just want to know the will of God. Here's the will of God. He says it's the will of God. There's a lot of things that make us, give us great. Read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You'll know the will of God, that you make yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. That's your reasonable service, which is the will of God. And here he says the will of God is to rejoice, is to pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. Don't Listen, verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. And I like that, test all things, especially in these two categories. Quenching the spirit and despising uh, prophecies. Because we live in a world today where I'll tell you, everybody wants to see the bizarre. They want to see signs and wonders. Listen, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ isn't dependent upon signs and wonders. He already did that in your life. And I think most people that have had a life change and Christ Jesus, they recognize that they are new creations in Christ Jesus are just so in awe of the miracle God did in them. They don't need, listen, a leg straightened in front of them. They don't need somebody to be slain in the spirit. They don't. And the, uh, the most ridiculous thing I saw was Benny Hinn throwing his coat out into the audience and everybody falling. Why do you need that? What did Paul say? Test them. Is it in the Bible? Does it exist in the Bible? Listen, I use these three things. Is it? Listen, did Jesus teach it? Did the apostles practice it? And do we find it in the epistles? If you do, go for it. And if you don't, don't see it in there. Don't do it. And don't listen to people that say, well, he did a lot of things that aren't written in the word of God. No, he told us how to behave in the house of the Lord. He told us how to behave in the house of the Lord. If you don't believe me, read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, 13, and 14. You know, there are, listen, directions and guidance for us in the Bible to do everything. So verse 23, this final blessing and admonition from Paul. Now, may the, listen, uh, I, I left out one verse. Test all things in verse 21. Hold fast what is good. Toss out the rest and then abstain from every form of evil. <laughs> I like Ch- Pastor Chuck said he loved, he loved sparkling apple cider. I love sparkling. I hope many of you love it because I like it. I only get it at, at uh at uh, Thanksgiving sometimes or at some weddings, they, you know, Christian, Christian, uh, uh, most Christian events don't have any alcohol at it. But then they invented this uh, sparkling apple cider. I like it. But unfortunately, it looks like a bottle of champagne. They put a, a foil on it and they, they made it into a green bottle. And it's, uh, and I'm thinking, boy, do you really want to see, be seen with that? I'm not being, um, uh, legalistic here don't feel bad but listen everybody has their own 
Everybody has their own freedoms. If I go into a, 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 a place to eat and I'm going to be sitting, and a lot of times my wife and I, for the sake of time, will sit in that area that's a sports bar area, and you can eat in there like at BJ's and, and some restaurants. It's just easy in and easy out. I don't, ha I, I, don't, I don't have any problem going in there to eat. But if I order something and it looks like that, don't put it on my table. Because it looks like it. It looks like it. And I don't want anybody to think I saw Pastor Dale with a bottle of champagne on his table. I'd have to blame my wife. And I don't want to do that. And my wife's sitting here, by the way. <laughs> and uh, don't, don't write in. She's already been told by a thousand people. Why do you let them pick on you like that? Uh, I just do it. Father, forgive me. She knows I love her. Listen, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, verse 23, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, but we're going to get into that one day, the trichotomy of man. But look what he says, the whole spirit, soul, and body, just to be quick, before you knew the Lord, if he was talking to unbelievers, he would say it this way, before your body first, and then soul and spirit. That's how it's described in the world. A body, a soul, and a spirit. But when you become a, a believer in Christ, now the most important thing to you isn't your body, isn't your flesh, but is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your spirit has been changed. May they be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. As if the Lord was coming today, people. Be upright. Be faithful. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. And I just did it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And let's all say amen together. Amen. God bless you. Keep you. Father, may you watch over them, protect them, keep them this week. Father, next week, what a blessing to be in person with them. And those who can't come will be with them also. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.